believe that the humanities and the sciences must progress in confidence. It may therefore seem encouraging that there are more areas of study, such as aesthetics and politics, where um, different perspectives from both the humanities and sciences are uh, emerging. This, 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 these developments, however, often progress with uh, absolutely no dialogue between distinct disciplines, and this is a problem. We will argue that the next generation of scholars need to be better equipped if, if they are to address these matters of shared interest. This means that students should gain more exposure through universal curricula, not only to both the humanities and sciences, but also to debate concerning how to navigate between the two. As Max Planck, uh, seeing on a particularly bad hair day, <laughs> once wrote, a new scientific truth does not triumph by convincing its opponents, making them see the light, but rather because its opponents eventually die and a new generation grows up that are familiar with it. Now, we're not, um, we're not waiting for someone to die per se. New ideas can, can emerge in them and go in advance. So here at Jacobs, fantastic provision is made for faculty from different disciplines to co-teach more experimental uh, courses. We have recently um, exploited this loophole to teach the course uh, the neuroscience of arts and politics, in which we argue that political science, social science, the brain sciences and humanities can best progress together. And this will be the core argument of our, of our talk today. Uh, we were planning on squeezing the entire course into these 80 minutes, but uh, at the last moment we decided not to. But we will give you two very solid, very real examples, which we think is important. Margaret will first um, argue that the political sciences need the neurosciences. I will then um, um, address the, the budding issue of neuroaesthetics and argue that without the humanities, this field is not really going to blossom. Albert Einstein was once asked why people could discover uh, atomic power but not the, control, uh, the means to control it. And his answer, which gets my physics students quite angry sometimes, was that that's easy, politics is much more difficult than physics. Um, and Einstein was one among many who argued that one of the biggest threats facing humanity was that the progress of the natural sciences had outstripped the development of the social sciences. Of course, the natural sciences have greatly enriched our lives. They uh, have given us new means of transport, production, new medicine, and so on and so forth. But they've always also given us weapons of mass destruction, ecological threats, the means of control needed for totalitarian regimes, world population boom, and so on and so forth. So the, the social sciences in general and political science in particular need to improve, need to catch up as it were, so that we can figure out how best to promote and peacefully use the right kinds of technology. Now that's easier said than done of course, because as we all know the social sciences are the real hard sciences, in the sense that there are lots of methodological limits holding the social sciences back. You can't, for instance, in political science, do many experiments. Um, um, and this is where I think, I'm going to throw this in a second, but this is where I think uh, the neuroscience, one of the uh, branch of na the natural sciences, can really help. How can, can neuroscience help political theory? Well, we should ask ourselves whether uh, um, the whether, the, the, whether social and political theories are actually compatible with the current state of neuroscience. Do these theories make assumptions about decision making and behavior that are actually physiologically possible or not? The leading political, there's a lot in here, the leading, the leading political theory uh, of the last 30 years has surely been rational choice analysis. Rational choice theory um, <laughs> I was going to show you there's a muffin over here for some reason. <laughs> Rational choice analysis argues that we're all the same, we're all homo economicus, right? It assumes an enormous amount of calculation. We all know the options that are at our disposal. We, can act, we all know the pros and cons of these options. We can rank unambiguously these options and we tend to choose this option, that option that is the best one for us personally according to rational choice. But if you, that is incompatible actually with how, how neuroscience understands the brain. 
such endless calculations, no, no scientist tell us, would actually overwhelm our, our, our brains in an almost literal sense. We take decisions mostly based on our emotions. Our emotions greatly limit the range of the options that we look at and bias us towards one or the other of these options. Right? Neuroscientists know neuroscientists know these endless calculations that rational choice uh, presupposes, but only as a severe mental disorder. Literally, uh -oh, literally pointed at the computer. Literally, as another hole in your brain. Did you do something? <laughs> <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> literally, as another hole, hole in your brain. <laughs> Interdisciplinarity at work. <laughs> if you have a lesion into your ventral medial prefrontal cortex, then you can no longer rely on your emotions to take decisions and you lose yourself in the endless calculations that rational choice presupposes. Another very influential social and political theory of the last 30 years has been post structuralism. Post structuralism goes to the other extreme. Post structuralism argues that we're all uniquely different and incomparably different. Why is that? Because we're all called in the web of language, or so post structuralism argues, right? Our, our actions are based, obviously, on our thoughts. And we can only think, again, obviously, with the help of words through language. But each and every language has all kinds of hidden, implicit assumptions. For instance, the very existence of the word Europe seems to imply that people from this region are on average somehow different from people outside of that region. Otherwise, why, why is the word? Right? So we have all these hidden implicit assumptions in language. We can think about these hidden assumptions, but we can only do that with more language. Right? So we can never step outside of language, and from this post-structuralism argues that there is no objectivity. All there is are entirely <coughs> unique individuals with their own subjective understandings of the world in which we live. Again, this is completely at odds with neuroscience, right? A, a group of researchers at the University of Parma, of all places, have discovered um, a mirror neuron network. Mirror neurons are brain cells that light up when you do something or when you see somebody else doing exactly the same thing. And neuroscientists argue that this gives us an immediate, intimate understanding of other people's intentions and actions preceding language. Moreover, neuroscientists argue that languages are actually based on that common understanding that mirror neurons provide. Right? So it is not true according to neuroscience that human languages are entirely subjective. They also contain objective elements. And <coughs> And in this sense, mirror neuron system actually belies post-structuralism as well. So here we have that the two leading theories of, <coughs> of political life over the last 30 years are simply not compatible with brain research. Right? And I, that also helps explain why there is so little empirical evidence for these theories. And I think that the popularity has been much more based on the kinds of political agendas that they enable right-wing politics in the case of rational choice and radical left-wing politics in the case of post-structuralism. But I do hope and think we can actually do a little bit better than that. There is a much less influential theory of political life, the cultural theory developed by anthropologist Mary Douglas and uh, political scientist uh, Aaron Goldesky. You can see Mary at the kitchen table in London with a very promising young political scientist <laughs> on a particularly good head <laughs> desperately trying to get into the frame. <laughs> um, anyway, um, this cultural theory stands in between the two extremes of rational choice with its insistence that we're all the same and post-structuralism with its insistence that we're all uniquely different, right? It says that we're both the same and different at the same time. Right? This, this is a theory that argues that each and every political and social domain is a forever changing combination of only four ways of organizing, perceiving and justifying social relations, individualism, hierarchy, fatalism and egalitarianism. Um, and because different people obviously interact in different social and political domains all the time, we are both the same and we are different at the same time. Right? The nice thing about this theory is that it is not incompatible with brain research. 
One, there is, there is no, it doesn't contradict any known neuroscientific principles, which is a bit of a relief for the young guy with the hair. And second, it, a number of leading neuroscientists have actually reached the same conclusion. People like Sam Zeki, Robert Turner, Antonio Damasio, uh, Dan Sperber, Stanislav de Haen, uh, they've all come to the same conclusion that the rich diversity of our social and political life it must be a re endless recombination of a much more limited set of ways of organizing, interacting, <coughs> perceiving, and so on. Right? Another nice trait of this theory is that it has clear implications for how to promote the right kinds of technology that Einstein was hoping for. Maybe this, this comes about, the theory argues, through deliberative democratic decision-making processes in which the advocates of all these different ways of life, all these different ways of interacting, are heard. So as a political scientist, if I can call myself that, I would, I'm arguing that <coughs> political theory will improve by having more neuroscience. It, 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 it creates room for, more, for newer ideas, and it is incompatible with our leading theories of politics. Then we'll talk about arts. So, I'm going to move on to a uh, very different topic. That of neuroaesthetics and argue the other way around. Yeah. Because contact with the humanities is, is really essential if this field is, is to develop. We all have an intimate understanding of, of our own tastes in art. What we find aesthetically pleasing, aesthetically displeasing. Of course, accounting for and explaining these aesthetic judgments to others is no simple task. And we all full well understand the complexity of, of the problem. The nature of aesthetic judgments seem to change across generations across lifetimes, and even on shorter scales, from year to year, from week to week, even from moment to moment. Often we are at odds with the opinions of others, sometimes we, we fall into agreement. From Plato's form of the beautiful to Kant's judgment of taste to Dewey's art as experience and beyond, philosophical debate has raged over wide-ranging questions that are still concern and interest to us today. Are aesthetic judgments objective? subjective or universally subjective in nature? Is it object properties or is it the experience of those properties by a perceiving, cognizing and feeling subject that drives aesthetic judgments? And do those judgments serve um, a purpose in their own right? Or might they underline a more fundamental biological utility with the barrels of bower birds naturally constructed, but we would argue rather Without seeing um, a consensus on, on many of these issues, scientists, of course, have waded into the debate in the hope of crystallizing a more coherent explanation of um, uh, aesthetics. Under the, um, under the umbrella term neuroaesthetics, researchers, researchers are applying a wide range of approaches from behavioral studies through to brain imaging in the hope of, of understanding the neural correlates and the cognitive processes that underlie aesthetic judgments and the aesthetic experience. In conjunction, work is being done on how contextual and cultural factors influence those aesthetic judgments, such as the aesthetic attitudes taken by a subject, or the environmental context in which stimuli are viewed. If, on your way to the Kunsthalle, a pigeon leaves itself down your front, if, on admiring any Sheila, a passerby declares it a fake, these are events that will colour the aesthetic experience of even the, the hardiest gallery goer. By trying to understand how these different factors interplay, ranging from innate perceptual laws through to more deliberative cognitive processing, scientists hope to model more completely the physiological, psychological framework within which um, aesthetic judgments and the aesthetic experience arises. Now, although philosophical debates can offer little in terms of practical frameworks, the empirical approaches of the sciences are mired in exactly those practicalities and their details that give the method its strength. With the aim of minimizing subject variability, any rigorous experimental design can only ever address a tiny fragment of a much larger question at any one time. Um, it is very early days in our understanding of how the mode and nature of stimuli presentation affect aesthetic processing. If you find yourself in a very confined space in a noisy brain scan, and you're asked to, to judge at a specific moment to quantify on a scale of one to three the beauty of an image you're looking at. Is the aesthetic viewing attitude taken by the subject sufficient 
if you want to probe the aesthetic domain. The question of what is being probed is also open to discussion. The way people talk about beauty, liking, preference, these are used interchangeably and um, yeah, these are used interchangeably and perhaps perhaps they uh, shouldn't be. Um, issues of technology, their uses in data interpretation also, me, also arise. Um, if in, in brain imaging folk study, for example, correlating psychological processes with a limited understanding of neural correlates is open to uncertainty. Interpretation relies on um, psychological models that are only in their infancy, an incomplete understanding of what those neural correlates mean, and also finding some other correlative experiments. But of course, with any emerging field, there is this process of constantly re-hypothesizing, re-experimenting, re-interpreting. And that's the only way a more stable framework of understanding can emerge. There are, however, serious concerns with the way the sciences approach aesthetics, both within science and outside of science. The decomposition of the aesthetic experience into something more empirically testable. Uh, the privileging of the brain in matters of artistic creation at the expense of the artist, and without due deference to other levels of explanation, be it cultural or, or, or art historical. Many also suggest that rather than probing aesthetics, most studies just use aesthetic objects to probe the brain, and therefore are not contributing to aesthetics per se. Although there are valid concerns here, there's also a great deal of, great deal of misunderstanding. Um, on the account that core assumptions about methodology, its validity, its practices, um, 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 often have difficulty being understood outside of, of any given field. But currently this also is an often unfounded hostility towards the scientific community. They're accused of being rather arrogant in the confidence of their methods. Even aloof, God forbid, and as endeavouring to, to brutally colonise the humanities. But let's move forward. No one domain of explanation is ever going to do full justice to the nuances and richness of our debates around the aesthetic, and none should have, have hegemony. As the neurosciences make the first tentative steps into this field, greater contact with the humanities is going to be essential. A great deal to be learned from trying to understand why quantifying aesthetics can fall on such enraged ears. Where are the genuine concerns? Where is there uh, misunderstanding? Where is there the prejudice? Um, a fascinating question still remains, and this is how the field will develop. How can the humanities help guide the brain sciences in better formulating their terms of engagement with aesthetics? How can we negotiate between a biological explanation of the fundamentals of the aesthetic experience and a cultural explanation for why our tastes in art con constantly change? And finally, can we flip this on its head? Might your aesthetics one day be able to contribute to uh, the way we frame art history and, and even art criticism? And in conclusion, our overall argument is obviously that the humanities, social sciences and brain sciences very much need each other and can only progress together. Um, this may sound, especially to this audience, like a non-controversial statement, but runs into a massive wall of opposition even at some of the best universities in Germany, no names. Um, and uh, of course, there is a lot of validity to Max Planck's claim about um, new truths only being accepted by new generations, but he, he, he missed that one tiny little thing, how this new generation can actually become aware and of and familiar with these new truths. And we would argue that only by um, co-teaching courses, <coughs> But only co-taught co courses that range across these disciplines can you perform this particular trick. These courses will, of course, not be able to rely on textbooks. They will go against the grain. They will establish, they will challenge established wisdoms, and they will put, put people, including ourselves and our students, out of their comfort zones. But that, I think, is what I, that, that we think is what education uh, should be about. Believe it or not, we did this talk yesterday in 17 minutes, so I don't know where the other 10 minutes came from. Thank you. <laughs>